am Khadija, and I am here today with Jerry Mitchell, investigative reporter for the Clarion Ledger, Jackson, Mississippi. Um, you know, I went and researched and found out that you're a native of Springfield, Missouri. Yeah, that's not yeah. that's a little known fact right there. <laughs> yeah, uh, you were in a couple of movies, Murder in the Black and White, Free yeah, of Ash. Yeah, documentary type things, yeah. Yeah, you know, I recall seeing those. <laughs> yeah, you you were much younger then, but you know. Yeah, I know. It was, <laughs> all this red has gone to white. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in good fashion, why don't you just give us a little bit of history about yourself as an investigative reporter of, of human and civil rights um, yeah. events? Yeah, well, I, what can I say? I... Uh, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer uh, was was asked one time why she chose to get involved in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And she said, I didn't choose it. It chose me. So I kind of feel that way. I, um, I went to uh, happen to see a, a movie, which I don't even recommend, but it, it, to people in general, it's called Mississippi Burning, which was about it's a fictional movie it's not a true movie but it's a fictional movie about the killings of the james cheney andy goodman and Mickey schwerner by the clan in mississippi in 1964 and i went happened to be there it was a press premiere two fbi agents who investigated the case were there and so I, after the movie was over with, I was like, had all these questions because I knew none of this. This was all, I was, you know, a dumb Southern white boy. I didn't know anything <laughs> about any of this. I mean, they didn't teach any of this in school. Right. And so I began to learn the truth about not just Mississippi's past, but this nation's past. And that really began my journey. And the other thing that happened is, I don't know if you're like me, but someone tells me I can't have something. I want it like a million times worse. <laughs> right. So there was something called the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission, which was a state segregation spy agency that infiltrated civil rights groups, smeared civil rights activists, you know, tried to run them out of the state, get them fired from their jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so Mississippi legislature in 1977 voted to like seal all those records for 50 years, more than 132,000 pages. So wow. when I found that out, I'm like, yeah, there is something in there. I know there is. <laughs> they wouldn't be, I know those state lawmakers, they wouldn't be right. sealing them up for 50 years if there wasn't something in there. Right, just kind of like the UFOs and yeah, lying around so, now. Yeah, so I, I began to develop sources, began to leak me the files. And what they show is the same time the state of Mississippi was prosecuting a guy named Byron D. LeBeckwith for the murder of Mega Revers here in Jackson in 1963. Um, the, this arm of the state, the Sovereignty Commission, was secretly assisting in defense trying to get Beckwith acquitted. Nobody knew that. And so that story ran October the 1st of... Uh, 1989 and and within the month the case got reopened after that so so um you know the big news derek chavon Ch Ch yeah Chabon, right? yeah the police exactly. officer with the guilty verdict i mean the got the yeah. came down three times exactly exactly how do you how do you feel about the verdict well, I, I mean, I'm always far more interested in how other people feel about it. How, how do you feel about it? <laughs> well, you know, it, for me, um, as a person that research and has a lot of curiosity, I'm kind of a, in, a, in a state of wait. Let's see what happens beyond the conviction. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of times where, you know, there's a conviction, but there's a overturn of that conviction. There's an appeal. Right. There's all right. type of things, statutes and laws that have loopholes, mm -hmm. you know. And so mm -hmm. I am waiting uh, patiently to really see what the verdict and the outcome is maybe two, three years down the road. Mm -hmm. That would really determine 
right. uh, temperature. But what makes me excited is the legislation that has come behind that and the investigation by the Justice Department. Right. And what did you think about what Attorney General Garland said, his remarks uh, I th yesterday? I think um, Minnesota is not unique, you know, um, to, to any city in the United States. What I feel is that it's a starting point. Mm -hmm. What I'm hopeful for is that the legislation that is created is not... Um, is 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 a nonpartisan thing and it's not mm -hmm. fought over you know one of the things alvin sykes did well was he was able to work across the lines to get yeah, his no legislation question. crossed and so you know i just take the same kind of uh leeway from him to just have that non-biased opinion to really get change done because i believe there is good people on both sides of the aisle i just think it's been muddy down have you turned my interview around on me <laughs> no, I guess I am. I'm, I'm a reporter. I always ask questions. So, you know me. I'm always the one asking questions. I'm not used to be the one that, that gets the questions asked. So. <laughs> yeah. No, well, it's. Uh, I, I find it fascinating, and I, I think we're going to. You know, obviously, the conviction of a law enforcement officer in these kinds of cases is rare. Very rare. Mm -hmm. So is this going to mean maybe some of these other, like obviously we've seen other videos. This is the George Floyd video is not the only video we've seen. So what's going to happen in some of these other cases? Are we going to also see convictions in them? Or is it going to be like Breonna Taylor where they kind of go, nah, we're not going to charge him. Or, you know, what, what, what's going to happen next? And then more broadly, I think, I, as you mentioned about the Justice Department, what I'm interested in is what, like you said, happens next. And I'm thinking beyond this case, I'm thinking, um, are we going to begin to take a look at uh, police practices? I mean, I'll give a simple example, and I've just written about this. In 1995, the Justice Department issued a memo that said, if you arrest someone and you handcuff them from behind, you shouldn't leave them on their stomach mm -hmm. for any extended period of time unless you're monitoring them. And the reason for that is that position alone, just by itself, can increase the risk of death by asphyxia. Just that position. And then you start adding in all the other factors. Um, you know, uh, as in George Floyd, he had kneeling on the neck. In this case in Mississippi, which is very similar, it's, it's basically video from inside the jail. Guy was in the jail. They all decided to hop on him. Uh, they were supposedly changing out handcuffs. Three and a half minutes later, he's lifeless. Mm -hmm. And one, one officer it appeared to be kneeling on his neck. So there's not, you know, th th this training is not happening. I mean, the, you know, law enforcement officers are not being trained. And I know that police department, I looked at their manual, there's no reference to any of this. Like, hey guys, if you have someone that's, you know, handcuffed, you don't need to leave them on their stomach and just leave them there forever. And, you know, because, because of this risk, nor do you need to climb on their, their back. So do you, do you think police departments across the country have a standard that they've built in of their own that doesn't follow any accreditation and that that's that why i think if they get kind trained, of passed on i think they get trained but they're not there are some issues that way either and i don't know completely it, it needs to be in my mind it would be a great national project is go check what are the policies of these particular police departments and then you have to be more, Minneapolis didn't have this policy. Like they didn't have a policy you could use a neck to knee, a knee to neck restraint. But when you went back and looked, they'd used them, you know, hundreds of times. So when you say, when you go back and look, it just reminds me of history that hasn't been told, right? Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, yeah. so when we talk about looking back, can we talk about like, the infiltration of su supremacy into the police department and where that started from, where the, some of these tactics begun. 
Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, and people don't realize it. It's even continuing today. I've heard of some other recent white supremacist groups that are, that's exactly what they're trying to do, either radical right or white supremacist group trying to infiltrate law enforcement. That's nothing new. Um, the Klan did that, and in, in, certainly in the 60s in Mississippi, they purposely did it. It was one of their purposes, stated purposes, like they wanted to go in and be an auxiliary policeman or auxiliary deputy or work for the law. You know, mm -hmm. they tried to recruit law enforcement officers. Edgar A. Killen, who was a recruiter for the Klan, used to hang out at the police department in Meridian, Mississippi. That was that he was recruiting people from there. And those were some of the people he recruited. Uh, I think I've heard estimates for some people who used to work there that it was like half the police force was in the Klan. So, I mean, that's what was going on um, all over, certainly all over Mississippi. And it certainly the Klan was not unique to Mississippi. Uh, a lot of people forget about this history, but the Klan certainly in the twenties uh, was a national organization. Mm -hmm and more than 4 million people belong to it. I mean, there, there's video of them marching, marching from the Capitol and past the White House and everything on video. If people are so inclined, go get on YouTube, and do Klan March 1924, and there they are, marching without mask, you know? And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a longstanding, they wanted to be credible and they didn't want to quote unquote violate the law, even though they were breaking the law. You know, that was the idea, if that makes any sense. Yeah, you know, I, I can recall uh, being in a rural town, uh, attending college my freshman year, running track and um, happened to wear orange reflectors for the fear of white supremacists running us off the road. I can remember right. the propaganda being in our mailboxes, you know, thank you for shopping, you, you know, you in words, thank you for shopping at our local Kmart, you know, wow. Kmart was big back then. It was. And um, I just can remember vividly seeing those things, but people walking around acting like it, it didn't exist, you know, no one saying anything about it. Um, it, it it kind of made me wish I had more guts back then or more <laughs> of a gumption to understand, but I was more into partying and uh, trying to maintain the status quo with the track team and didn't really, you know, do what I was supposed to do. But I, I just vividly remember the difference. And I also remember in high school, um, you know, Missouri, Sedalia, Smith Cotton, you smear, familiar with Sedalia? Um, a little small town in Missouri, and yeah. um, we we took a trip there. And I remember this is the basketball team. I remember pulling in and rocks being thrown at the bus mm -hmm. and being spit at. And yeah. and I don't know what made our coaches decide to you know send us through this, but we actually paid each team. And I remember the coaches and. The, everybody and the referees telling our coaches to sit down, boy, you know, and all kind of calls being called, uh, people being spat upon. And I just didn't understand the need to walk through that. Like we, uh, you know, as a black person, mm -hmm. you understand what racism is. Like, sure. not like you've never experienced it. So I just right. didn't get it. Um, other than I, you know, it vividly sticks out in my head as um, something that has never changed, you know what I mean? In these mm -hmm. rural parts mm -hmm. of town, I think about when I hear the uh, men hanging from trees in 2020 in Mississippi and they're calling it suicide. I'm like, there's no way possible that a black man would hang himself from a tree. Of all things, a tree <laughs> it's, it's just symbolic of everything that we're mm -hmm. against, you know? Right. Um, so th it's just like, I think, that lack of history has just brought us to kind of like a halt, um, but the, the the weight of it has brought us to an awareness of waking up, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah, and that's it. I mean, you hit the nail on the head, which is we keep repeating our history because we don't know our history. And, you know, if we knew our history better, we we wouldn't keep repeating it. But that's kind of what we, we saw in George Floyd case, Maude Arbery, 
you know, which reminded me a lot of um, whatever reason of the slave patrols, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because in the days of the slave patrols, which was before the Civil War, they, um, every white man had a right under the law mm -hmm. to, um, had rights over that black person who are, you know, man or woman, whatever it was, uh, you know, like, where are you going? You know, they had to produce papers if they were traveling, where they were going. And they could literally whip uh, someone who was enslaved. Uh, I think it was 30, you know, the, the biblical mm -hmm. 39. And so that, that, that would, they could, they had that authority as a slave patrol. So the slave patrols, and, you know, and posses and things like that are what really gave rise to more into the sheriff's department later. You know, that was the, the idea of this kind of rural law enforcement, for lack of a, a better term. Yeah, you, you know, you try to explain that to people, um, but it's one of those things that they have to dig deep for the, the rich history of that, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I, I'm kind of like, sitting in a place where I wonder what will happen to the history. Um, you know, I know the local historians we have in Kansas City are dying off, you know, mm -hmm. the older mm -hmm. they get. And I'm just praying that we have people that come behind these, um, that they pass this information on to, to yeah. carry it on, you know, or even the ideal of museums to, to continue Absolutely. the legacy. Um, people like to call it African American history, but it's really white history. <laughs> It, you know, it's, it, it's our history. I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It affects all of us. And, and uh, the sooner we realize that, I think the, the sooner we can have a solidarity toward, you know, more justice. Which brings me to like, you know, the fabric of history and what a lot of people like to say is the catalyst of the modern day human and civil rights movement, which is Emmett Till. Yeah, absolutely. You've investigated and reported a lot on Emmett Till. You want to give us just a little bit of background on Emmett Till? Yeah, I mean, I, let me tell it in a, in a personal way, if that makes any sense, uh, if that's okay. Um, that's fine with me. So, you know, the first time I was aware of Emmett Till was Eyes on the Prize mm -hmm. and saw that picture, which I had never seen before. Uh, you know, of Emmett Till after he was beaten so severely and thrown in the river and just awful. Uh, and then fast forward a little bit, I started working on these cases and the Megar Evers case got reopened. And then right, it wasn't too long after that, they did, Chicago, City of Chicago decided to name a street after Emmett Till. Yeah, I well, think I we were to Chicago for that. And yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I, I wound up interviewing his mother and talked to her quite a bit. And of course she was, I talked to her about the mega Rivers case and, and, you know, continued conversations with her over the years. And of course she was interested in justice for her son. Um, obviously, um, you know, kind of what began to be believed about this case came from, unfortunately, came from William Bradford Huey, you know, the article that he wrote mm -hmm. for Look Magazine. Right. And, and I have to say, to be honest, when I first started reading about the case, I thought all that was gospel. Like, this is a confession from the killers, right? This is all gospel. And now I that almost every word in there is a lie. It's very fascinating. And you, you realize that, that um, the killers lied because they didn't want to put where they killed and beat Emmett Till in the correct place. Otherwise it would implicate others. And they didn't want to tell exactly where they threw his body in the river because they didn't want, you know, everything had a consequence, so to speak. And they didn't want to finger the other people that were involved. There were quite a number of people uh, from what you can tell now that it were did, involved. Did this information come out in Carolyn Bryant's book or you found that out? Way no, you, I, I can point you to the documents themselves. Um, for example, here's a simple example of one, uh, like Carolyn Bryant lying, all that stuff. That's been known for a while. It actually came out before that book came out. Um, 
so so the defense you know for whatever reason took notes on their interview with Carolyn Bryant shortly after it took place. Mm-hmm. I guess I should explain that for those people who don't know this story. Um, so Emmett Till went with his cousins to a store in Money, Mississippi, which is a little tiny little place right across the street from the, you know, where they were picking cotton essentially. Mm-hmm. And so they went, they actually, their, uh, his great uncle Mose Wright had been preaching and they went on over to this store, which is not that far away. And uh, we're going to get like a Coke or candy, you know, that kind of typical kid thing. And Emmett Till goes in, his cousins who I've interviewed said, you know, he didn't do anything basically. Um, but anyway, but did whistle at her. This is according to them. Did whistle at her when she got out, you know, and and then they got scared, uh, given Mississippi's mores <laughs> of race, mm-hmm. and 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 sped away. Um, and so her story, original story, which is in these documents, which I have a copy of, was that. Um, she was, uh, Emmett Till came in the store, wanted to buy some candy. He obviously sounded like jokingly grabbed her hand and said, Hey, you want a date? And she pulled her hand away board. and she pulled her hand away. End of story. Other than Emmett Till whistling at her. Um, and then, but her husband found out, uh, there's some debate about whether she told or didn't tell, uh, you know, she said she didn't and, um, apparently not. I mean, uh, at least best we can tell someone else did tell her mm-hmm. and then he found out and then he took his half brother. That was Roy Bryan. He took his half brother, J.W. Milam with him. And then they went out to where Emmett Till was, uh, staying with Mose Wright and his cousins out there and, and kidnapped, you know, ducked him from there. And then mm-hmm. of course, horribly beat him and there were other people involved they they just brutalized him the um this all took place in a barn which is still standing a barn uh in um not too far from drew mississippi it's it's west of drew mississippi and this which, would be money mississippi right you well money is where uh the store was okay. and to the 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 Delta is a big place. So this is Drew, Mississippi, which is the store is in uh, Lafleur County, which is it's about ten miles from Greenwood, Mississippi. Okay. So All right. Okay. And then and then the store the barn is a ways away. It's in near Drew, Mississippi, which is in Tallahatchie County. Um, it's not even in the same county, uh, and so. Um, they took them. I think I got the counties right, but anyway, it's in Drew. And then anyway, they took, took him out and, and, um, and, and beat him severely, just severely. So severely, there was some talk at one point of carrying him to the hospital. And one of, one of them said, yeah, don't bother. Cause it, it was obvious they had beaten him so badly he was going to die. And they, so, uh, so he they was him. retrieved alive is what you're saying. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. He was still alive and they oh, beat him God. severely. And Willie Reed, of course, testified, heard the screams from the barn. Um, there was testimony on this, but this was all hidden because in a Huey piece, he put this in a completely different town. He put it in Glendora. I it have never. It didn't happen in Glendora. It happened. It happened where I'm talking about in this barn. You know, I've heard this story a lot of times, and that part has missed me. No, and a lot of people don't realize it because it's kind of been told so many times that people think what they're reading is true. I mean, it's not anybody's fault. They think what they're reading is true, but it's not. It, it's. Uh, it was all at this barn, and the reason is because. Um, Milam's brother ran the plantation where this barn was. So it kind of makes sense. You know, if, if you put it where the barn is, you're implicating your own brother who was involved. Right, right. So uh, he was involved in that. So anyway, that's that's how that. So if you read Carolyn Bryant's 
kind of going way around the way around on this, but <laughs> well, that was, that was very Bryant's, educational, right? Yeah, getting back to Carolyn Bryant's statement, uh, what she said was, I, I mentioned that, said that you know, you know, he asked me for a date essentially, mm-hmm. and that was it. Well, the 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 defense obviously wanted to seize an opportunity here and ratchet it up and make it like a rape case, right? Right. And that's what, so literally weeks later, after she gives this statement, which we have the notes for, she goes into the courtroom and testifies that basically Emmett Till all but raped her. Mm-mm-mm. Pressed himself up against her. Da, 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 you know, I don't even want to repeat it. Anyway, and, and, and why they like. And so the, those guys got away with it. You know, Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam got away with it. There's, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that happened. I mean, the 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 this, this white citizens council visited with the jurors, like the jurors that were deliberating in the case. I mean, it was jury tampering or all sorts of things that happened in that case. It's well, I mean, it, it, to me, the, the the depiction of that is a normal depiction. It's not out of character, especially if you look. African Americans and second class citizens and some are right. still looking for, you know, voter registration and have them right. do hoops for stuff like that. It's 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 not unimaginable for me. And and that was the third killing within week within months in Mississippi. Um like um Reverend uh George Lee had been registering black voters in Humphreys County, it's, it's a place called Belzona, and uh, that's the way the locals pronounce it. And so while he was driving home, he literally got shot in the face. Uh-huh. Um, and the sheriff who quote unquote investigated the case claimed that uh, they weren't shotgun pellets, they were fillings uh-huh. from his mouth. Wow. Yeah, I, I remember that, that story. Um, I remember, um, you know, Erin Wilson apologizing to John Lewis. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And to me, you know, I'm a realist. It just didn't seem enough. I remember yeah. um, be, <laughs> sitting there at, and Alvin was on the panel. I think this, yeah. came, this, this either was aired by a C-SPAN or somebody. I, I can't remember. Right. But um, I asked Erin Wilson the question of, I, you know, I know you are sorry for what you did to Congressman Lewis, and we greatly appreciate that. But I was like, you know, back in that time, you guys were just rogue with it. I want to know what else you're sorry for. <laughs> and they panned the cameras from me and swooped me away. And I was like, well, what did I say? And I was like, you can't ask questions like that. I mean, like, and yeah, I, well, I, like, that was a good question. <laughs> I think it's a really good question. And the other thing is a good question with that is, okay, if you're really sorry, what amends are you going to make? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it really, I, I think at the time, maybe it was a consideration of naming that bridge after John Lewis or something. Yeah, like yeah, there's some talk of that. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was really the, the center around it. But for me, it just didn't make sense that you apologize for that one act. I mean, I know he's a congressman, but I know you beat probably many other people. So yeah, I can on, say you're you're a Klansman, you may have done some other things. Yeah. yeah, let's be real, you know, tell us the real story. And they were like, nah, we're not having that today. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, and I've covered some of these cases where Klansmen have turned against the other Klansmen and testified, you know, had that kind of situation. Yeah. You, you know, you, you, they searched their conscience and have a wake up call of morality. Right. Um, you know, speaking of all of these different events, which I, you know, we can't, I can't mention Emmett Till without mentioning Alvin Sykes in the legislature. Absolutely. He created, yeah. you know, as his executive assistant, can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with Alvin and oh, yeah. reporting on him? As- I, I, you know, I love Alvin. He's just a tremendous guy. I um, got to know him through working on these cases and he, he got involved in either coming to trials or, you know, attending some of these trials and 
working on uh, the Emmett Hill bill, which, listen, that bill would have never happened. It was entirely his idea. Maybe some other people who helped conceive it with him, but certainly he deserves credit for passing. It would have never passed without, without Alan's persistence. And uh, I was really amazed by his, his knowledge of the law. He's not a lawyer at all, but he would go to the library and hang out and figure these things out. I was always amazed. Like, wow, Alvin, that's really, that's really wild. He, he was overwhelming with it. He was a fanatic and he overwhelmed me most of the time. I'm just going to uh, be honest. He's smarter than some lawyers. I, I got to tell you, he was, you know, about oh, the law I'm talking about. He was, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, can you fact check this for me? Is he the only African American male who's not a um, elected official that has created legislation in the United States? Is that I have no, I have no idea on that. I always hate to say someone's the first or only, or you know, without fact. I, I believe he's way. the first. Um, he may have been. He may have been. And uh, until someone proves me wrong, I'm going to keep saying. Uh, you can keep saying. <laughs> got my permission. Yeah, I apologize later if I'm stand wrong, you know. But yeah. So when the Teal Bill um, came into fruition in 2007, mm -hmm. can you tell us what happened did, right. with, with the cases? And, yeah, they, they and what really sparked that? Well, you know, they were already doing these cases, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and Alvin certainly came down and attended some of these trials and, you know, we attended some of these trials together. Um, but really Alvin's the one that pushed this idea of, Hey, why don't we provide funding and, uh, other resources for, you know, prosecutors and others, you know, they have the resources to pursue these cases. So why don't we, why don't we provide this support and help and other things like that? So, um, so that's what that's what we did, and eventually got Congress to pass it. Cool, cool. Um, you know, for me, I would like to see the 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 Teal Bill utilized in 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 a fuller trajectory in yeah. the country. And it hasn't been used much. I mean, and of course, the cases were limited to those up to 1969. And now the most recent incarnation, what's up to 79, is that right? Well, it's, it's opened up wider than that. And they've changed it to HR 35, which includes the LBGTQ community. So it includes all those cases. Yeah. And so um, even though it includes those cases, I think it needs to be utilized. And I'm not for sure if the appropriation, which is the funding part, has been assigned to it or not. But that well, you know, didn't have any funding initially. Well, I know in 2007 oh. it didn't, and um, zero funding. Well, yeah, I can remember going to see um, Attorney was, General, uh, Assistant Attorney General Perez, trying to advocate yeah. for the funding. Which made no sense at all. It was really crazy because you know the FBI to head this off had their own little press conference and all that kind of stuff to try to say, oh yeah, yeah, we're doing these cases, we're doing these cases you know, to get out ahead of the Emmett Till bill. And then when the Till bill did pass, they didn't have any resources that I'm aware of that they shared with, you know, local law enforcement or, or you know, district attorneys, you know, prosecutors. It's, so. it's it, you know, when it comes to a law, it seems to be a catch 22 when it comes to actually, you know, rendering justice. And so that's the problem I have. Uh, the excuse, I remember was that, you know, we had 133 cases. That's all that, you know, came forward out of those cases. I think like 10 of them were solved. Um, but the idea of getting more people to come forward from the community was the part right. where the funding really would have been beneficial. Yeah, you could have had community events. You could have done different things. Right, and that was supposed to be coupled with the FBI, you know, you know having that liaison position between the two. It's something that I still push for um, as I work. They for still COVID. don't have that. I don't think. No, they... no. And, you know, I, I'm heavily pushing for them to put a, 
a liaison position that comes from the community that are love people from the community oh, yeah. that can work side by side with the FBI helping you know people comfortably come forward they just refuse to do that and I think it's just all one big part of the fabrication of cover-up and corruption yeah. um, which lends me to why it it needs to be evoked in more of maybe even a branding way, a campaigning way for, with mm -hmm. the Justice Department. Mm -hmm. There's no sense that we have all of these issues around the country. I mean, look at Minnesota. Why isn't it evoked in Minnesota? Wouldn't it make sense? I mean, it's inclusive right. to everyone, right? I mean, I am I wrong? I, I know you're an investigative uh, reporter and not a lawyer. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. But yeah, you, you, you could certainly utilize this in looking at, you know, any of these cases from, from a perspective of racial, you know, like hate killings or whatever um, that took place. Absolutely. So did, this is a question that I like to ask a lot of people that I feel have been bitten by the teal bug, you know, the spirit of, of the teal family. Um, did you imagine the legacy of Emmett Till living for this long and no. did you imagine that black people will still be being murdered for simple things like whistling and products that cost less than twenty dollars did you imagine that no I mean you know and nor did I imagine in you know 2020 that someone would be killed you know for a uh, over a counterfeit $20 bill, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. It was just, you know, all these things are hardly, I can't imagine them. And, but it has to do with perception of people toward others. Um, there's a, there's a book that came out years ago. It's called faces of the enemy. And basically the idea of the book is, you know, before we kill with our weapons, we kill with our minds. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's taken place in, in almost all these cases that we're talking about. The people have killed with their minds before they ever kill with their weapons or with their knee or whatever, you know, whatever the situation is. Right. So, um, you know, one of the things about me interviewing is that I get long winded. <laughs> one of the rules was like, keep the interview to 45 minutes. But, you know, this is a heavy conversation. Oh, okay, all right. I didn't, I didn't mind it going over. I greatly appreciate it. But I do want to give you some final thoughts and to plug yourself if there's anything that you want to make, yeah. you know, well, there's one other thing I, aware. I, yeah, I'm happy to talk for just a minute. Uh, one is, I, I completely forgot about it, finishing off because I got sidetracked telling the story of Emmett Till. The, the rest of that story of Emmett Till is, so I, I told you they had named a street in Chicago after Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. So I called Roy Bryant. He was still alive. I telephoned him. What do you think about their naming a street in Chicago after Emmett Till? And oh man, he went off. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, they're doing what? And he just went off. <laughs> And of course, I wanted to get him down. You know, I like to interview these clan guys and get them to talk, you know, because they never know what they're going to say. Um, and I, I tried to get him to agree to an interview. And he basically was like, you know, he wanted money. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, I can't really do an interview for money. I, if I've been smart, I think I would have just gone anyway. And right. So, You're like, it's the cream. Buy, see if I could buy him a sandwich or something, you know, for lunch. And, <laughs> Get him to talk. Um, but yeah, it was it was really interesting. Um, but so back to so the so the Meg Rivers case by this point had been reopened, and um, so I'm thinking about this case too, uh -huh. and thinking about legally. And I was like, wait a minute, they were prosecuted for murder. They weren't prosecuted for kidnapping. It could be prosecuted for kidnapping. Oh. And so I go into the Mississippi. Well, I had somebody who knew the law much better than me. And I, I asked him about it. I said, well, it would be in that code from that time, which was, I think, 
1942 or something like that. And so he pulled it up for me and, and, and it turned out that the, uh, it was, um, uh, only a two year statute of limitations on kidnapping. I could not believe it. I was just sick. Wow. Wow. So what, what I mean is, so if, what if, happened if, if in it had not been, if it had been like murder and not had a statute of limitations, that would have been the next case I were, would have worked on. Would have been. So the, the, that's the huge loophole when it comes to kidnapping and murder in the instance, because that was my next question. Is yeah, you know, well, it's, it, it, at least in Mississippi at that moment in time. Now it's different. It's it, there is no statute of limitation, but at that moment in time. For whatever reason, they didn't have a uh, statute of limitations. So I did want to mention that I, I, I and I've, I have felt bad about that ever since. Um, you know, felt badly about that because it's just it's awful. The, the law was awful, and therefore you couldn't address it legally. Um, and then, uh, but of course, I'm you know I mentioned some of these cases I worked on. I worked on the Mega Evers case, uh, the Vernon Damer case, which a lot of people don't know who Vernon Damer is, but he was a civil rights activist, voting rights activist who was killed by the Klan for that work in Mississippi in '66. And then uh, the Birmingham church bombing that killed the four girls. And then the um, what I already mentioned, the Mississippi burning case, and the, the three civil rights workers who were killed. And I was fortunate enough to work on all four of those cases. And if, if people are interested in reading about that, uh, I do have a book that about that. It's called Race Against Time. How can they get that book? Go online, you, you know, whatever, whatever. If you're an Amazon person, go on Amazon. If you're, you know. So they basically can readily find get it anywhere. in a number of places. Get anywhere. It's, uh, it's in hardback, it's in paperback now. You can even get it in an audio book. And uh, I, I got to do the audio book. I was pretty excited about that. I, uh, I, I really wanted to do it because this will sound awful. I wanted to do the clan guys, you know, because I, I knew what they sounded like. You know? and so you kind of wanted to like impersonate them like? Yeah, yeah, that's what I did. I impersonated all the clan guys. Yes, let, let, let's hear that as a closing. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll do, do Byron Deal. What that Deal accent Beck. sounds like. Yeah, I'll do, I'll do Byron Deal back with. I went and visited him, and he killed Meg Revers. He's the assassin Meg Revers. Spent about six hours talking to him. Absolutely the most racist person I ever spent serious time with. The N word this, N word that. He believed that he believed Adam and Eve were white people, and you know, there's a whole long Christian identity thing with that. Uh, but anyway, it was starting to get dark. He insisted on like walking me out to the car, and I'm like, really, that's okay. I think I think I can find my way. So he gets me, walks me out to the car anyway. He gets me out there and says, "If you write positive things about white Caucasian Christians, God will bless you." Right, negative things about white Caucasian Christians, God will punish you. If God does not punish you directly, several individuals will do it for him. Oh, man. You, <laughs> you should have been an actor. <laughs> oh, I love imitating. I love to imitate. You know, it's fun. You know, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm probably not very precise, but I enjoy it. It's, it's, I, well, I enjoyed that. That was pretty That was, uh, that's, uh, if people are interested in the audio book, I actually got to do the audio book. I was, that, I, had a, I had a good time doing that. That is super. Well, you know, we got to close out with some good theme yeah. music because this was absolutely really, really I, good. I, I mention one more thing, and which is, uh, I was with the Clarion Ledger for over 30 years, but now I run a nonprofit called Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting. In fact, we just, people want to go on and check. We just did a video very similar to George Floyd, this man in jail in Mississippi who was killed. Do you, um, so do you investigate outside of Mississippi? Yes, but within limits, you know, we, we only have so much resources to devote outside of Mississippi. So we do so, some. So I know we're supposed to close, but if a person um, wanted some justice and they seek yeah, an they investigation, investigation, yeah, they can well, email. Well, what what are the steps that they need to take first? What what do they need to have before they approach you? Seemingly what they can get before they come to you. I ideally because this is uh, this is something people don't know that they Yeah, know. yeah, yeah. Well it's a really important point. 
the best thing that can do is is collect documents you know that and you know that from working with alvin i mean that you you that's how you begin to work a case you begin to collect these right. documents and begin to piece these things together it's very difficult if someone contacts me and i don't mean critically toward anyone but if they contact me and go oh yeah um this happened to me or it happened to somebody else i know but they don't have anything you know it's just kind of their word you have to go get all these things well it's a lot a lot harder because you know how much time you know what i mean and and you get requests like this all the time so how do i decide which one to go well the one where i someone just gave me a stack of documents well that's you know right I'm, right that, that makes it just makes it easy i don't have to go fish down 20 pages of the internet yeah, i don't have to I or have i don't have to go to the courthouse in right you know up in the mississippi delta and go find you know these records from 20 years ago or whatever they are so it, you know a lot of people don't understand this either it's also a temperature check just like a job application of what exactly. gets weeded out and what doesn't get weeded out so the more information you can provide for your case the better you're going to serve probably getting justice the less yeah. you have the exactly harder it's it. going to be you yeah. know what i'm saying so um, let's go ahead and close out and I'll be looking forward to maybe a part two, or maybe educating people further on how, Absolutely. how they can get justice because I'm believing in empowering people. There's no more Martin Luther King or Malcolm X. You really right. have to empower yourself and understand the law. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and close out and I'm going to leave people in my favorite words. And that is love is the most powerful weapon on earth. Jerry, I thank you very, very much. Thanks very much for having me. No problem. And yeah. uh, we'll always remember Alvin Sykes. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Alvin's great. So. Have a good rest of the day on purpose. Right. God bless. Thanks very much. All right. Bye-bye. program is brought to you by the Kansas City Business Association.